Welcome back everyone to Exploring Quantum Physics. Now we're going to complete the solution of the hydrogen atom according to classical mechanics. And this brings in the identification of a non-trivial constant of the motion. This is something that was known uh, for many years uh, by people studying planetary motion, but emerged as uh, something of great importance in the development of quantum mechanics. And I think uh, you'll see that it, it points one, two directions that are very fruitfully uh, used when one goes to solving the Schrodinger equation for complex systems. Well, we'll see. Now, just to remind you where we are, we're still working on, we're leading up to the Bohr model of the, of the atom by, by solving the classical problem. So um, uh, when, you, when you do the homework, you'll probably be reminded of some of this material. Again, I just like to keep in view that our objective is to understand uh, real physical systems. Now, maybe some of you are tiring of seeing these spectral lines, but I never get tired of them. Okay, here's where we left things at the end of the, the uh, last lecture. We have these two constant of motion, energy and angular momentum, and that means that we know that if whatever the initial configurations of the particles are, they move in a plane that's determined by their uh, initial orientation. And then the, the motion in that plane is also restricted to have a constant energy. So that basically there's going, to be, there's going to be an orbit in the plane because uh, there's, 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 no, there's not, um, you can't have a sort of a continuous, um, uh, well, at, at any given point, there'll be some limits uh, in the motion that are determined by the energy, as we shall see. Okay, now how do we make progress? Well, we started with these two first order equations in motion. Now, we then, for the, the uh, vectors r and p, then we took um, scalar products you might say r is a scalar, r is the square root of a scalar product. And we found that there was um, a conserved quantity, the energy that just depended upon the scalar products of the vectors with themselves. Then there was a vector um, uh, constant of the motion, an angular momentum r cross p, that's also constant in time. Well, what other things do we have to look at? Well, from the uh, value of angular momentum, uh, we know that r and p lie in a plane. So um, what, a, what other independent vectors do we have that might lie in, this, in the plane? Uh, I think you'll easily see that these two, r cross l and p cross l, both lie in the same plane as r and p. So maybe there's some advantage to, and they're, they're independent variables, um, maybe there's some advantage to looking at the equations of motion when framed in terms of these two, uh, two new uh, vectors. Because after all, um, since they lie in the same plane, that's quite possible that there's, uh, there's a simpler relationship between all, all four of these vectors than, is, than meets the eye right now. Okay, let's see what progress we can make. So here's, let's take R cross L and look at it in greater depth. So then we can just say that's, um, that's simply that, uh, R cross R cross P, uh, which is then just substituting for R and R dot is that takes that form. Now we're going to invoke uh, well-known vector identity to this is the so-called back cab rule um, again this is something which uh, this is going to come up again in the quantum theory of angular momentum so it's a good idea for at least to be aware uh, that such a thing exists and then uh, later on we'll see how you'll develop a sort of vector calculus that will help you easily rederive it uh, so this is how you when you have uh, two cross products, you can you can reduce them and simplify them, and so that gives um, 
when one goes through the math, uh, here's here's this. Uh, just rewriting that identity. Then from the back cab rule, um, you get something that's proportional to the position vector and the velocity vector. And now a remarkable thing happens uh, when you simplify this. And I think it's really worth your writing notes on this or, or freezing the screen, pausing the screen, and taking yourself. This is a very, this is a very elementary, very elementary derivation, just a sequence of simple st steps. And you see what it gives you is that um, uh, R cross L is the time derivative of the unit vector times R cubed. Now, what about P cross L? Let's look at its. Uh, let's look at the time derivative of p cross l. So that is uh, just. I mean, this is an obvious identity since l dot is zero, and so um, we now get uh, another another cross product of r cross l. So in other words, uh, well, let's let's just see where that takes us. So you see that r cross l is equal to r cubed times the unit vector of r dot. So this, um, this equation implies that r unit vector dot is equal to m minus r cross l divided by r cubed. But you see, that's what we have here. So that means that this vector, the sum of uh, p cross l and the, and the unit vector of r, is a constant of the motion. Uh, this is often called the Runge lens vector. Uh, there's a Wikipedia article on this that's uh, very, uh, very useful, very readable, very informative. But I hope I've given you uh, a path to rederiving it. Actually, when you know that something exists, when you know that there's something that involving p cross l that results in a, quant uh, a constant of motion, then you can uh, you should be able to calculate it again for this system. Now the remarkable thing here we are. We have the energy, we have the angular momentum, we have the Runge lens vector. The remarkable thing is that the in some sense, the identification of the Runge lens vector solves the problem for us. Because, uh, look at this. Let's ca calculate the scalar product of r dot a, which is r, sorry, r a cosine phi, if um, this is r, and that's a. That's phi. So we we know we first of all we know that a lies in the same plane as r, and um, uh, and p. And so um, we we now know. So that means that the. Um, uh, the location of r is more or less precisely defined by the angle phi. Okay, but now taking r dot a uh, from just from here using this identity, say r a cosine phi is this um, is this quantity here. Now here is um, here is one of these uh, vector identities a dot b cross c. I hope you will recognize what to do with that. And in fact, we'll, um, you can use, if you can recall that identity, you can use it to complete the inline quiz, or you can, um, you can try computing that directly yourself. And uh, in any event, let's have a look at the quiz. OK, so dealing, dealing with this, 
uh, it's a dot b cross c. Uh, there's a cyclic identity that's equal to let's say let's say we we move everything around cyclically. That's equal to c dot a cross cross b. It's equal to b dot c c cross a and so on and so in other words um, this term just reduces to the square of the angular momentum and so now uh, let's see I'm sorry for making such a mess here let's try to get rid of it it's a very straightforward derivation well now you see now you see we have a very simple equation that relates r and phi. Thusly. So here here is an equation that defines the orbit. It shows r as a very rather simple function of the angle phi. And that's apart from specifying uh, the origin of time, or you know, uh, once you have the values of these constants of the motion, um, things pretty much fall into place. So let's see, we've gone on for quite a while. Um, so one final calculation that we'll do here. Um, we have, this is, by the way, this is, an, this is a, an orbit which can be a circle, an ellipse, or a hyperbola. And uh, the distinction between those depends upon the energy. So there's one last uh, calculation uh, that is worth doing and that is to calculate a squared. And um, I'm going to leave that to you as an exercise. It's, it's worth doing because uh, it's, it's a fairly straightforward calculation. And this is that calculation gives us a relationship between the magnitude of a between and the energy and the angular momentum. So in other words, the energy, the angular momentum, and the Runge lens vector are each constants of motion. But as this equation shows, they're not entirely independent. OK, forgive me, but this is literally the last of the inline quizzes for the moment. Uh, and what, uh, what it's going to be used for is to show you uh, the significance of the value of the energy. In other words, for this system, uh, as we'll see, the energy can be any, well, let's just take the quiz. So I hope you persuaded yourself that the energy of this system can be absolutely anything uh, from a, between minus infinity and infinity. For example, uh, you, can have the, you can have the momentum vanish at some given time. Let's say you just have these godlike powers for specifying the initial conditions. You can keep keep p uh, at zero, and then bring the particles arbitrarily close together and get an arbitrarily large negative energy. Or you can move to some uh, to some finite value of r, and then crank up uh, the value of p to whatever you need. You can make it as positive as you like. And once you fix the energy, it stays that way for all time. Now, the critical thing to remember, uh, this has to do with um, some of the, the readings in the um, uh, supplementary material that will be on the homework, is that there's a, a, a separate point of separation between positive energies, or between negative energies and positive energies. So when the energy is less than zero, uh, all the orbits are elliptical. So these are like the orbits of the planet, planets about the sun. You, you can get to highly elliptical orbits uh, that are far distance away. Those, those orbits have negative energies, but they're approaching zero. Uh, for e greater than zero, you have a type of trajectory where, let's say here's the, the proton, the electron comes in. And just it just visits once and never leaves. So um, 
these, these two types of classical orbits actually have counterparts in the quantum mechanical spectrum.